If you talk to people like Monday night, people are saying, oh, this is correction territory. We're talking 10 percent down, 20 percent down. And then it went away. And yet the Evergrande thing didn't get solved. What happened? I think what happened was initially people were wondering, was this a risk to the financial system the way Lehman was? And the answer to that is no. We're talking about properties. And in China, you can't even own a property. You lease it from the government for 70 years, and then it goes back to the government. So, And then you th think about who's financing it. And again, it's a lot of state-owned or primarily state-owned enterprise banks. So the problem is, is containable within China. That's not the real risk. The real risk is the risk to global growth. If you look at China real estate as a sector, it comprises 29% of Chinese GDP. China, in turn, is 18% of global GDP. And so the Chinese real estate sector comprises 6% of global GDP. And so if China has now taken a turn and decided they no longer want to support all of these over-indebted property developers and they are going to cool their real estate market, that's a risk to the global economy. And so I think of this as contagion in the old fashioned way, more like in 1997 when I was living in Hong Kong during the Asian financial crisis and less of a 2008 Lehman moment. So the risk here is that property development goes from being a driver of Chinese GDP to a drag on GDP. Um, and so I think, I think that's really, really um, underestimated still. And it doesn't matter if they're making their bond payments or not there are clearly going to be some write-downs, but the risk is to global growth. And when you look at a market that is on a 38 times cyclically adjusted PE, that number has only ever been higher once, which was during the dot-com crisis, any risk to growth is a risk to earnings and multiples. And so when markets are expensive, you want to think about what can go wrong and not focus on what can go right. So I don't think we're through the Evergrande um, scenario yet. Um, and, uh, you know, in, if you have a slowing of global growth, you are going to have increased quantitative easing. In 1997, what Greenspan did was he lowered interest rates while the contagion went through. Powell doesn't have that option. So the two most important words from the Fed this week were if and may. And I think their estimates for 7% growth in Q4 are are really high. I mean, it, you, that's what we experienced in in Q2 when you know the, right. the, the fiscal spigots were open. So I, I think the risk is growth here. So Gershon, let's go over to you on the fixed income side, if we could. Uh, if, if it was ever ground on the equity side that people were worried about, people were pretty worried, I think, about the tapering here. And yet the bond market just took it in stride, despite the fact that Jay Powell, I thought, pretty much said, yeah, we're going to taper. We're going to taper like November, December. Why isn't there the same fear of a, a taper tantrum this time? Well, I think it's important to focus on what, what really matters here. Yes. the. Chair Powell surprised us by being a little bit more transparent. It, it, it seems like they're going to taper, start tapering, absent something crazy happening in November. But that's actually not that important. What's much more important is when are they going to finish tapering? When are they going to stop buying assets? If you think about it, at this point in the economic cycle, it's not the buying of assets that is impacting the economy that much. It's the forward guidance that, it, it, that it's signaling. The Fed is not going to raise rates until they're done buying assets. So they actually have to stop. And, you know, you read between the lines, we're forecasting that they're going to end up tapering a lot quicker than they did in the 13, 14 timeframe. Um, this time, then they were doing about 10, tapering about 10 billion of treasuries and 5 billion of mortgage-backed securities per Fed meeting. We think it's more likely to be per month now, which means it would wrap up uh, sometime in the middle of next year. And the key there is it gives the Fed optionality. You know, Barbara's point is exactly right. We don't know what the, we, the Fed, when they're honest, doesn't know when they're going to start raising rates and how fast. What they want to set themselves up to do is to look at what happens over the next few months. You know, there's still two, two very big questions, there are probably more, but the two very big questions that are unresolved are, one, is this inflation we're seeing persistent? That's still open for debate. And... Uh, you know, what's the impact of growth going to be from the Delta variant, from China, from all the other things going on? And, you know, based on how that, that set of data comes in and the state of, of the world, they'll either be in a position where they won't do anything for the remainder of 22 and they'll kind of push off starting to raise rates, or they'll be able to start and maybe be very aggressive. 
It's it's very dependent. So I think for, for a change, I actually think the Fed's being pretty transparent and keeping their options open, which is the most important thing to be flexible to, to see what happens uh, coming forward. Robert, and be, beyond uh, the Evergrande situation and the fear of tamper, tapering, there's another risk that got injected into the marketplace, and it came once again from Beijing and some of the regulatory authority. At the very end of the week, Beijing said no more trading in cryptocurrency at all. It didn't seem to have a big effect on the markets overall. It did hit cryptocurrency with Bitcoin down over 5%, I think. Uh, but what does it tell investors about China right now? Because it seems to be almost capricious coming out of President Xi these days. I think it's really interesting. This is probably the seventh time uh, China has banned crypto. You can only actually ban something once. So what it really proves is how difficult it is to ban. Anyone who has access to the internet has access to the Bitcoin network, and Bitcoin is the currency of the internet. You know, when they ban banned mining, 47% of all Bitcoin mining was taking place in China. And if I talk to people that own these um, exchanges, they actually think it was great because it increased network resiliency because Bitcoin miners had to leave China and are now looking at Texas and Canada and Norway and places that have cheap energy, right? Or, um, so um, I, I was surprised that Bitcoin was not down more. Um, it, it, it actually proves how resilient um, Bitcoin is right now. Gershon, let me ask you the blunt question. Are we paying so much attention to crypto because it's just fun to talk about? It's kind of sexy, as it were? Or is it because there's so much liquidity in the marketplace because of the Fed, because of the ECB, the money has to have somewhere to go, and that's really, really juiced the cryptocurrency craze? Yeah, I, I think that there, look, there's a lot more than just talk about it. Like There are um, asset managers, other investors looking to offer products uh, through blockchain. Uh, particularly in the offshore market. So it, it is a real thing. I, I think, look, the, the, I, I don't have a, I'm not an expert in, in Bitcoin itself. So I don't know whether the, the self tape was appropriate or not. I do say, think that the, there are a couple of other issues that brings to the forefront of, of today's news. One is, does the fact China's doing this make it more or less likely that the SEC is going to start to regulate? And there's been a lot of murmurings around that. And the second thing is just a reminder to us that China can and will do unpredictable things, not just as it relates to Bitcoin, but you know what they're going to do in terms of, of the Evergrande situation is, I, I agree with what Barbara said before, I don't think Evergrande itself is systematic. Certainly the entire property sector is, and if that, that could be a Lehman moment if they didn't take the proper uh, steps, but we believe that they will.